time with Conservation Northwest. Um, a little housekeeping. We're always curious how people find out about events. So how many of you found out because you're current members and you got emails from us directly? Okay. How many found out only through posters? That's great. How many found out through the green group list? Or through any other lists or friends? Okay. Hi team. Any other groups? Okay, great. So Conservation Northwest has been around for 20 years, and our reason for being is connecting habitat so that source populations of wildlife can, 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 can breed with, can find and breed with other populations, other unrelated individuals. So we try to build resiliency in the landscape by connecting these broad habitats. And we did this connecting the South Cascades and the North Cascades with the Cascade Conservation Partnership. We're doing it with WILD with uh, the I-90 bridges right now. And we're also connecting the Cascades and the Rockies with the Columbia Highlands Initiative. But it's imperative that we make sure that they are, there are these healthy source populations of the most important animals that keep these systems vital. And perhaps no animal is more important than the wolf and its ability to alter and improve habitats. So we are the lead group right now in wolf recovery in Washington State. And in fact, any of you want to come down with us to Olympia tomorrow and speak up for the wolf recovery plan, we have a caravan going down in a happy hour and, and we welcome any participation. Um, we have a couple special guests here today. Um, one is Jasmine Medbashian, and Jasmine's in the back. Jasmine is one of our movie stars. She <laughs> is uh, right now working with BBC on a special on the recovery of wolves in the West. And Jasmine is a Conservation Northwest employee, and she'll be available for questions after the presentation. But the main presenter today, um, I have the honor of, of introducing Dave Moskowitz. Dave, raise your hand. <laughs> Dave is a, a tracker and a photographer and a conservationist and an educator. And Dave took on a very difficult project. How many photographers in the audience? Um, I am a, a professional photographer and I envy photographers who can get the elusive subjects and get compelling images. Dave's able to do this. And one of the reasons he's able to do it is he knows how to find animals through their tracks and other signs. Without further ado, Dave, it's yours. Thank you. Uh, well, I just uh, I'm super excited to be here and share some of the uh, images and some stories from the past year and a half. I've been collecting material for a book on wolves in the Pacific Northwest, and there's really a unique story uh, unfolding here in our region, in our state, and neighboring states. That's going to be a very different story. Uh, as wolves return here and then maybe in the Rockies and, and other places. And uh, uh, there is something very captivating about wolves. And the more that I got out in the field and studied them and learned about them, I realized there's just this amazing sense of knowing of wolves, in part maybe because they're so closely related to dogs and this is an animal we live with, and in part because they're really closely related to us. Uh, um, wolves. They look all different ways. There can be many different colors. Uh, they, they come in a variety of sizes. Uh, but the big thing about wolves is that they're social animals. And this is something that you can find in their tracks and their signs. And it's a, it's a very important part of how come they're so ecologically uh, powerful is uh, because it gives them flexibility and, and, and their reproductive abilities and then also uh, flexibility in the types of prey that they take they can take on it and the amount of prey that they uh, can consume and then how they shift the behavior of prey. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But as far as being social, this is something that we can relate to as humans. We're also social animals and uh, we have a flexible social system just like wolves. And actually many of our ancestors uh, traveled and lived in small groups and uh, migrated around the landscape looking for food much like wolves do. So I think there's a long history of understanding and relating to one another. Uh, that goes back into um, <laughs> prehistoric times. Uh, wolves are quite playful, as is typical of many social animals, such as ourselves. And 
and uh, have very strong family ties. This is uh, three pups, and uh, this is uh, for those three pups with their mom. And we were right there, set up in a blind on the edge of this meadow, and got to watch those three pups, and they were kind of cruising around the meadow. And then uh, one wolf, one adult wolf, came down the meadow, and the pups kind of looked at it and was like, "Oh, it's pretty cool." And then another wolf, adult wolf, came down. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. And then this wolf came down, and the pups just went ballistic, and they like tackled her and really like, licking her. And it's pretty clear this is probably mom, but it just uh, just showed up. So. Uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, for me, uh, the doorway into finding wildlife, and actually, really, most of what I've learned about wolves has come not through watching them, but through interpreting their tracks and signs. And uh, there's all sorts of fascinating stories that um, that tracks and signs can tell you about wildlife. And one of the things about wolves is that they love to run. They're, a, they're an animal that was evolved to cover long distances. They've got these great long legs. They're designed to run down their prey rather than stalk them or ambush them. And uh, anywhere you find them, whether it's on, this is uh, the coast of uh, Vancouver Island or in the mountains in the North Cascades, They'll seek out parts of the landscape where they can cover long distances, uh, shorelines, ridge lines, uh, roads, uh, and you can find their tracks there and then you can follow them and often they'll lead to some really interesting stories. And you can see here these tracks of a, a wolf coming in and there's some wolf scats and then coming across here is uh, bald eagle tracks and, and this is an elephant seal carcass. And this is when I'm starting to talk about a very different story that's going to unfold here in the Northwest. You know, you hear about wolves in the Rockies, you hear about elk, you hear about them eating cattle maybe. You don't hear about them eating elephant seals. <laughs> you don't hear about them eating uh, uh, humpback whales that wash up on shore. And uh, you don't really hear about them eating things like salmon. And I'm going to talk about salmon uh, a little bit here coming up. So it's a really different story. But as far as finding actual wolves and watching them, uh, I found this uh, carcass. And then uh, my partner Darcy and I set up a blind um, in the rocks. And uh, and then lo and behold, the wolves came, and you got to see the actual actual wolves feeding on the carcass. So it really gives you a, a jump start being able to interpret wildlife tracks in terms of finding an animal that's as elusive uh, as wolves are on the landscape. <clears throat> Sometimes the uh, the story about how wolves are interacting with the landscape is there even if the wolves are not. And uh, this is a, this is one of those stories. This is in uh, the Selkirk Mountains. This is uh, a moose in the, that lives in the range of the diamond pack. The diamond pack is the second wolf pack documented in Washington State. <laughs> and I was uh, out looking for the diamond pack in this wet meadow because I found tracks in that area the day before. And early in the morning I stopped down to the edge of this wet meadow and there's a beaver pond in the middle of it where the beavers had backed up the little uh, creek that ran through the, the meadows. And I found this moose. And it's a cow moose. It was late in, it was early fall, late summer, and I was like, well, where's the, where's the cat, where's the cat, where's her young, because usually uh, female moose, uh, cow moose will have a calf with them at this time of year, but uh, she didn't have one. And so one of the things about wolves that you may have heard is that uh, they tend to look for certain parts of uh, their prey population. They'd much rather go for a young moose rather than a full-size moose because it's a little bit easier for them to capture, or a sick moose rather than a healthy moose. And they're looking for parts of the population that are most vulnerable. And of course, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, this relationship between wolves and their prey is one of the things that has helped make prey what they are today. So uh, the speed of our prey animals, of uh, deer and elk, and the uh, actually the, the uh, foul temper of moose all come from having interacted with predators like wolves for a long time. So. Moose, unlike deer, deer will flee when, when they get attacked by wolves, but moose, which aren't very fast, will turn and face them and be super aggressive and like cornering. And if a moose does that, usually the wolves will go away. So their size and, and their demeanor actually come from their relationship with, with predators like wolves. But in any event, uh, this moose was missing her, her calf, and in the woods later on that day, I found the remains of uh, a uh, calf moose. And probably the diamond pack had, had uh, killed and consumed that calf, that calf. So it's just another interesting story of the presence of wolves written into the landscape there. 
Some other interesting things here in the Pacific Northwest is uh, uh, not there's many things that are on the food on the uh, diet for uh, for wolves, including these guys, uh, black bears. And this black bear was out on the beach uh, feeding on sand fleas. And, and studies in British Columbia, and actually some <coughs> evidence here in Washington State shows that sometimes black bears end up on the diet for for wolves as well. So this is a one of the things that's really amazing about wolves is that they impact all these different parts of the landscape and can have really significant impacts on them in their feeding choices. And this is the remains of a, a black bear right on the border between Washington and Canada in the North Cascades National Park in Washington State. And uh, there are signs that this black bear had been fed on by, by wolves. And when you look at this uh, bear skull, one of the things that I noticed is that it's a very old bear. And this fits with the general demeanor of wolves, which is that they're looking for vulnerable parts of the population to feed on. This, this uh, bear is missing all of her uh, lower incisors, and you can see uh, her canine tooth is cracked. So this is a very old animal. It may be that the wolves didn't even kill it and just fed on it. It's, it's unclear, but it fits with that whole idea that they're going for vulnerable parts of the population, typically. <coughs> but of course, how we mostly know wolves is that they feed on large game. Um, elk, things like that. And this is a this is a wolf from northwestern Montana that was feeding on an elk that her pack had likely killed. And this is where we start getting into some of those interesting relationships with humans, and where we share uh, some similarities. We also like hooked animals <laughs> to eat, and so we, there's a little bit of a feeling of competition. And this is also very natural in the in in nature is that animals that share similar food preferences feel a sense of competition. Wolves can't stand coyotes because they feel like they're competition. So they'll go out of their way to kill coyotes whenever they can. Which is an interesting story that I'll come back to in just a second. But there's many things that benefit from wolves being on the landscape. Grizzly bears, an endangered species in our state, uh, often come in on carcasses of animals killed by wolves. And this grizzly bear, uh, this elk had been killed by wolves the day before came back the next day and uh, found this food bear feeding on it. And then eventually it dragged it off to a more secluded location. Well, then where did you find that? Where that was in northwestern Montana in the, on the uh, west side of Glacier National Park. Yeah. Why do you think that the wolf pack didn't pick it clean? Uh, so the wolves probably ate quite a bit and then uh, they may have uh, retired and then the scavenger such as the grizzly bear came in or Grizzly bears will be assertive, and if they're hungry enough, they'll push wolves off of their kill and, and take them. And actually, black bears will do the same thing with uh, uh, mountain lions. Here in western Washington, you'll see the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that, again, the wolves are basically feeding other parts of the uh, natural world. And <clears throat> the fact that there's things like grizzly bears uh, that want those carcasses will actually increase the number of kills, potentially, that wolves make, so that might increase their impact on the landscape uh, in that way. But besides grizzly bears, uh, eagles, ravens, badgers, martens, foxes, all sorts of animals uh, will come in and feed on, a, on an animal that was killed by, uh, by wolves. And actually around that one carcass, around this one carcass, I came back after the bear had dragged off to the main part of it. I came back a couple days later and I found the tracks of Black bears, grizzly bears, wolves, coyotes, badgers, marten, red fox, uh, and then ravens, stellar's jays, and magpies all around this one carcass. And it was really this like, feeding frenzy created by the wolves. <coughs> this is a Olympic marmot. Anybody seen an Olympic marmot in the Olympic National Park? Yeah. yeah. Really cute, right? Do you think that these guys would be friends with the wolves, or like, do you think that they, their relationship with wolves would be like friendly or hostile, or what do you think? Full meal dessert. They look like dessert, right? I mean, that looks pretty good. <laughs> the funny thing is, is the Olympic marmot has a hundred percent of its habit of its habitat protected in national park or national forest wilderness areas. A hundred percent. There's not a single place where Olympic marmots live that isn't doesn't have the highest level of protection that we can give a landscape. And they're in rapid decline heading for the endangered species list. And 
there's a really interesting story here that relates to wolves again, and it's not the presence of wolves, it's the absence of wolves. When researchers studied the Olympic varmint, they found that the most important, the, the largest uh, source of mortality for them was coyotes. Coyotes eat these things left and right. They love them. Well, coyotes never used to be in the Olympics. Back before European colonization, there was no wolves in the Olympic Peninsula. There's no coyotes in the Olympic Peninsula. There's lots of wolves. And uh, when the wolves were extirpated, and then there's habitat changes that went on, clear cutting, road building, uh, farm fields produced. Coyotes migrated from across the Cascades into the Olympics and set up shop. Wolves will eat marmots, but like you said, it's kind of dessert, right? It's not something they focus on. So they'll go up into those high meadows and hunt elk in the summertime, and then occasionally they might eat a marmot or two. But for coyotes, this is like their main source. They, coyotes can't eat elk, so they will come in and focus on it on a species like this. And so there's some question, if wolves ever came back to the Olympics, if they were able to return there, uh, what that would do to coyote populations and how that might in turn affect marmots. And if they don't, there's a lot of questions about what the future of the species is. Uh, so this is one of the really unique things about, about wolves, is that they have really unexpected uh, impacts on, on landscapes not just through their immediate behavior, but through how they impact other parts of the landscape. So, and there's uh, the Olympic marmots and Manistus, coyote. Very similar, very closely related to wolves, but a little bit smaller and not as uh, able to, to kill large prey. So I want to briefly talk about some of the places that wolves live here in the Northwest. This is a, a member of the Salmo pack. This, I believe, was the third pack documented in Washington State, also in the Selkirks, in the northeast corner of Washington. And uh, I, I captured this image after trailing the pack too close to their den site and setting up a blind. And the forest there in the Selkirks is very thick. The only place I could get a clear shot of it was when I was crossing a logging road. And you could actually hear it coming, not by it, but by the, the ravens were calling as it was coming through. And then I had my camera set up, and it just had about three seconds as it crossed the road, and I got one photo of it before it disappeared into the woods. So. Here we are in the Pacific Northwest. So this is where the Selkirks are in the northeast corner of uh, Washington and Idaho and up into British Columbia. And uh, there's a steadily growing population of wolves in this area. Of course, this is the North Cascades, the Lookout Pack, uh, which many of you may have heard about, uh, and then the Tianaway Pack right down here. In or excuse me, right down here, right at the southern tip of the North Cascades eco-region. Uh, over here in the Wallowa Mountains in northeastern Oregon and southwest, southeastern Washington, there's a, an increasing population of wolves as well that are, have uh, established themselves from wolves in central Idaho. And, uh, and then all along the uh, coast in British Columbia and on Vancouver Island is a pretty robust population of wolves. And actually, this population up here in the Central Coast is a population that survived uh, back when we got rid of all the wolves in the Pacific Northwest and even in Southern British Columbia, the wolves up here survived and they have been the source population for wolves in further south in British Columbia and then in part at least into the North Cascades. So. Here's what some of those landscapes look like, which is incredibly diverse. That's a lot of different landscapes from the coast to the mountains arid areas, rainforest. Uh, this is the tracks of the uh, alpha male of the lookout pack. That's uh, Lookout Mountain, uh, the namesake for the peak in the North Cascades. That's that same, uh, from that very similar place, very similar place taken in the springtime. And uh, the lookout pack spends its winters and, and uh, springs in the lower elevation here where the deer migrate down out of the mountains. And then in the summer goes up to the high peaks in the, in the uh, sawtooths and uh, feeds on deer up there that have migrated to higher elevations. <coughs> Here's another image of the Lookout Pack's home range. Uh, really stunning and really diverse landscape that that pack inhabits. This is the Salmo Priest Wilderness in the Selkirk Mountains, and that's in the northeastern part of Washington. And this is, uh, that area is home to three, I think, documented packs right now that are strictly or three packs in Washington State. And the Selkirks are really dominated by amazingly dense forests. 
really, really beautiful, dense, dense forest. And this was a rendezvous site for the Diamond Pack, right on the Washington Idaho border a few years ago. Then you go down to the Wallawas, and this is really the, the leading edge of the Rocky Mountains uh, here, and the town of Joseph sitting down here. The Amnaha Pack operates in this area and spends winters down at lower elevations in the grasslands and shrub step and then in the summers goes up into the into the higher mountains again following the deer and elk on their migrations. How are the ranchers in the Palama County dealing with wolves? Very hostile. It's okay. a very hostile environment for, for wolves and actually there's a, um, there have been um, there have been numerous documented uh, points of wolves killing livestock there and that has led to a wide variety of conflicts including the state killing some of the wolves there. Uh, as well as a lot of efforts, creative efforts to try to, try to reduce those, those conflicts. But there are some structural flaws to our land management system and where humans like to live and where wolves want to go that will create, create conflicts for them indeed. Yep. The places that it's nice to raise cattle are often also the places where deer and elk want to go in the, in the winter, and so then it just creates this natural conflict. This is the uh, Inaha Canyon, uh, which the Inaha Pack is named after. So again, just tremendously different landscape yet again. This is uh, part of the range of the Winaha Pack, and this is a pack that goes back and forth between Oregon and Washington. And not much is known about this pack as of yet. They had one animal radio collared, and it was promptly uh, poached and killed about two weeks later, so they didn't get any data from that. And uh, Oregon's been uh, as yet to get another animal collared in that pack. So we don't know much about it, but we know it lives out here. That they have uh, field techs going out and doing track transects all winter long. They keep finding traps in this area. And then the British Columbia coast. Uh, just rain-soaked, rainforest. Think about the Olympics. Uh, it's very similar to that landscape in Vancouver Island and on the British Columbia coast. And the wolves there spend a lot of time, if they're coastal, it's tr truly coastal, they spend a lot of time in the intertidal zone uh, hunting for things like crabs, uh, digging up clams, uh, scavenging carcasses that wash up, like that elephant seal. Uh, and then hunting deer that might come down, or bears that come down to feed in the major tidal zone. Uh, they also will hunt uh, uh, river otters and raccoons as well. So a really diverse diet there. Uh, there's some places, and this is where it's really exciting, the work that Conservation Northwest is doing. There's places that really should have wolves, and could have wolves, uh, that don't yet. Uh, and one of the places in Washington State that really is just ready for wolves is uh, the Southern Cascades. And this is uh, Mount St. Helens area, Gifford Pinchot National Forest. There's a huge herd of elk. And actually, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is like, we have way too many elk here for the landscape, for what the landscape can tolerate in the long term. And this would be a great spot for wolves to show up. Getting there, it's a little bit tricky. And uh, the work around making I-90 of a, a corridor of landscape that wolves can pass across is an important part of that. And then making sure that there's uh, connected habitat between current populations of wolves in places like uh, the South Cascades is really, really important work. Uh, this is the Tyatin River Canyon. Tons of uh, elk and deer and bighorn sheep winter here in Yakima County. Again, another landscape that is really just ripe for wolves to return if they can, can make it there. Uh, and then the big question, as I mentioned before, is the Olympics. The Olympics has excellent wolf habitat. There's been lots of research on the feasibility of wolves returning there, and, and pretty much it's pretty well concluded that wolves would do well there if they can get there. Uh, but the obstacles in terms of highways and human development are quite large uh, to get them there. So how they will get there remains to be seen, but great, excellent habitat waiting for wolves to return uh, from the beautiful rainforests out there and in the high country as well. The wolves probably historically migrated up and down following some of the elk. And then there's probably other packs that live just coastally as well in that area. And this again is this really unique story of what, what goes on with wolves in the Northwest. Uh, you don't think about wolves as swimmers, but indeed uh, in British Columbia and actually historically in Washington State, they did swim. And there's accounts of wolves all over in the San Juan Islands. And they swim back and forth between the islands, just like this one. <laughs> 
do is cross the channel. <laughs> Just like a dog, you know it's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing I mentioned with wolves is wolves in places where there's lots of salmon will eat lots of salmon. In the fall, in places in British Columbia, salmon is the primary thing in their diet. And they eat lots and lots of salmon, which is something they probably did in lots of places in, in Washington State and may again as well if we can maintain our salmon runs here. So this uh, I just uh, came across this, came in first light to this uh, stretch of uh, stream and uh, found all these fish laying out there. And there's one fish that hadn't been fed on at all, and it started flopping when I got to it. And I realized that the wolves had just, just been there. But interesting thing about wolves, when they feed on salmon, they just eat the head. <laughs> and uh, sometimes bears will do this. Usually bears will eat more of them. But uh, the, the, the brain is the most nutritious part of of the salmon, so some people think maybe they're just going for the most nutritious thing, and since there's lots of fish, they'll just keep getting that. The other interesting thing, many of you know if you have a dog, that salmon can carry a parasite that's deadly for canines, and the part of the salmon's body that's least likely to have this parasite is the head. Now how a wolf would know that, nobody knows, but this is how they feed on salmon. So something for you to keep your eyes out on if you're out and about on salmon or streams around here. Very distinctive for wolves. Coyotes will do that occasionally as well, but definitely atypical for anything else. Can it be because of the bones also? I mean, are that just the bones and yours? Well, probably not. If This is a good point. You see the end of this antler? The wolves ate that, and they actually like that. And wolves are really well designed to eat big bones and crack really big bones. They can crack the femur of a moose even with okay. bones. Or but out of fish bones. But those are not meals. Mm, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think other carnivores eat, you know, like bears eat the whole whole fish, and it's not a problem. So I would guess that that's probably not what's going on. But they could wolves could be a little fickle like that, and just think, you know, like fish bones. <laughs> just go just go for the brain. So. And then one last piece about that's really important part of the story of wolves is uh, is their impact on riparian zones. And this is actually another issue in the Olympics as well as other places. In Idaho, where I spent a lot of time tracking wolves and teaching about wolves, we'll often find carcasses killed along riparian corridors. And uh, this is uh, a carcass that was killed right on the edge of a stream. And one of the things that happens when wolves come into a landscape is they start, uh, they'll take down animals in places where it's easiest for them to do that. And often stream corridors make it easier for them to catch an animal because it's uneven terrain. So it gives them a little bit of an advantage over something like an elk. And all of a sudden, these stream corridors become very dangerous places for prey species. So they spend less time there. And then what you have happen is a big flush of riparian growth come up in places where wolves return to a landscape. Because the prey species, even if they're not being fed on, they just don't want to go there as much because it's dangerous for them. And uh, in, what you'll also see is that those animals will behave differently. This is an elk that's feeding, and, and this is a deer that's being vigilant. And in places where there's wolves, prey species are far more vigilant. And they spend a lot more time with their heads up, looking around. And this impacts their productivity and, uh, and can also impact the choices about what part of the landscape they want to uh, use. So these are the elk in the Olympic Peninsula. And they're the least vigilant elk I have ever met. <laughs> I took this with a 50 millimeter lens. So I was just right there and they could care less. And what the elk there have done is basically made these beautiful forests with nothing underneath it. But ecologically, this is kind of a problem. They have literally eaten all the shrubs out of out of these forests. And researchers, they've done research out there where they made exposures. When they put up this eight foot tall fence, the inside and the outside looked the same. And uh, when they excluded all these elk, you have all of this uh, shrub growth that comes up in there. And there's lots of benefits of that to biodiversity that comes, that disappears actually when you have an overabundance of elk and a lack of predators for them. Uh, this is a stream corridor. This is the Ho River. You can see this uh, willow has just been eaten down to an elk uh, by elk. And the elk population in the Ho River blossomed after the disappearance of wolves. And this is the stream channel of the Ho. And one of the things you'll notice is there's no shrubs on it. And that increases the amount of erosion into the stream. And this is typical of overgrazed landscapes. And uh, it's 
pretty likely that the per a large presence of wolves would change what that landscape looked like. And then just to wrap things up here, a few more thoughts. Uh, we, the Northwest is home to, has lots of different wildlands on it, and many of them have been impacted pretty, pretty heavily by um, humans, and they will continue to be. And we need things like wood, and we need resources from our landscape. And how wolves in interact with these built landscapes or these changed landscapes really varies. Wolves actually like roads uh, to travel on because they're running animals, so it helps them get across the landscape. Uh, but they don't like people. And wolves, most of the wolves in British Columbia, over 90% of the wolves in British Columbia that are killed by humans are killed within 200 meters of a road. So it's a really big source of mortality. There's some really creative stuff that's, been, that's gone on to try to mitigate the impacts of roads on wildlife, and Conservation Northwest has actually been involved with, with some of this stuff, but closing roads uh, to protect wildlife is a really important thing, and actually the, the uh, Salmo Pack lives at the end of a gated road that probably wouldn't uh, be able to get there if, uh, if the road is open, and uh, gating roads is important. And then the other thing that we that it's hard for us to think about is you can't just leave landscapes alone. And the Selkirks are another great example. Uh, we have suppressed fires there for decades, and it's led to these dense, dense forests. The biodiversity of these forests is actually fairly low, and the productivity for game species is also fairly low. And so uh, there's been a lot of work between conservation organizations and uh, uh, rural interests and uh, logging interests to come up with restoration logging plans that increase productivity of these landscapes, return them to a more natural setting, and then also provide some wood for people and some jobs for rural residents. And uh, this is an example of one of those cuts in the cell curves. Uh, really promising possibilities for moving forward in a really collaborative way. And this landscape pretty will um, benefit wolves highly and the species that they prey on as well. So it's not that humans can't, we have to leave everything alone. We just have to be thoughtful about how, how we're using the landscape. Uh, and then one final thing, I just uh, part of my work is uh, in collaboration uh, with Conservation Northwest. I work at Wilderness Awareness School, and uh, the two of us work together on a citizen science monitoring project. I think there's actually some folks in the room that have been involved with it. And uh, Conservation Northwest wildlife monitoring stuff has brought like a lot of insight into what's going on with wildlife in the Northwest. And this photo from a Conservation Northwest camera of wolf pups uh, was the, the first uh, pho photographs and documentation of uh, wolves breeding in the Pacific Northwest in decades. I think it was, what, 70 years? And uh, so really exciting work that's been going on there. And uh, um, yeah, I think with that, I'll leave it. That's wolves in the Pacific Northwest in half an hour. Wonderful. <laughs> So Dave, stay up here, and then Jasmine can come up here too. One of the things that Dave mentioned that I think is really critical is what wolves do for habitat. And I did a book on called The Owl and the Woodpecker. There's about owls and woodpeckers, and these these birds use snags to create their nests in. And many birds require snags, and many animals require snags. But one of the things that happens, as Dave mentioned, is when wolves are part of an ecosystem, the deer and the elk don't hang around. And one of the things that I had noticed, and they noticed in Yellowstone, is there's a huge problem with little, small trees not growing up to produce older trees and then snags. Many of our forests have these big old trees, and all of the saplings get grazed out by elk and deer and other ungulates, so that there's no future for the cavity nesting birds or, or certain riparian areas without the wolves coming back to regulate the system and get wild animals behaving wild again. And this, this effect is called the trophic cascade, where the wolf changes the behavior of animals and creates a richer environment for many other creatures. So we have to recover wolves in Washington State. Jasmine Nabashian is our Special Projects Director at Conservation Northwest, and a big part of her work is put is helping move forward a wolf recovery plan for Washington State to allow us to hold on to and recover our wolves. And Jasmine, if you want to say a few words about, um, maybe touch on some things Dave may not have mentioned in this presentation about our wolf effort, and then we'll do Q&A. Sure. Um, I think no animal better represents our mission, which is to connect 
two connected wild landscapes because this is an animal that requires, in some cases, 350 square miles of part of their home range. And they can travel great distances um, with those long legs of theirs. So having connected habitat is so important. And David alluded to some of our work, the I-90 Bridges Coalition, which is working to uh, make a, habit, a series of habitat bridges over I-90 so that the large blocks of habitat south of there in Mount Rainier and Gifford Pinchot and north of there in the Alpine Lakes Wilderness can, can be connected and they're not fragments of habitat. So that's the core of our work and how it benefits wolves. But we've been a lot more hands-on lately with the direct, the most important habitat, I think, for wolves. It's been said that the most important habitat for wolves is in, in, in the human heart. And that's really what our biggest challenge is is to build social tolerance. Um, these are controversial animals. You've probably read a ton in the media about ranchers versus wolves and hunters versus wolves. Well, that debate is now well established here in Washington and we're in the middle of trying to finalize a draft conservation and management plan for the wolf. And there's a great plan that Conservation Northwest worked on with a stakeholder group um, that included hunters and ranchers and biologists and everyday citizens, and it's now before the Fish and Wildlife Commission to finalize. Um, we worked hard on this plan for the last four years, and it, it provides a lot of tools for ranchers so that they can coexist. Um, money for compensation, um, money for collaring and monitoring the packs so we know their locations, um, so we can keep cows out of wolf territory, and minimize conflict. Those are just a couple examples um, of what the plan includes. Um, but I just learned today that there's a lawsuit that got brought forward by the Cattlemen's Association and the hunting group to basically remove wolves from the endangered species list prematurely. So there's, there's still a conflict and controversy brewing. So we're really trying to cut through that and identify solutions in this climate. It's not easy, um, but it's really the, the only way we're going to move forward. So that's a little a little taste of the kind of work that we're doing. Um, we also are launching a pilot project this winter, which is really exciting. We're partnering with a rancher in Northeast Washington um, near the Selkirk Mountains who runs his cattle right smack in one of the wolves' territories. So we raised money to buy one of these really fancy GPS collars that that enables us to really understand where these wolves are moving so that we can give that information to the rancher so he can keep his cows away from the wolves. And then eventually we want to train a whole team of riders, range riders, um, to go out and ride, ride around the cattle because we've learned that human presence is the most important thing for deterring wolves to, from attacking livestock. So keeping that human presence on the ground. So that's, that's um, a pilot project we're going to be launching this winter, and we're very excited about that. Um, and um, that's, that's a little, little sample of what yeah. we're up to. Thanks, Jess. Yeah. So in, in summary, um, Conservation Northwest is working to connect broad habitats so that wolves and other animals can, reco can both recover, but also be resilient in, in times of climate change. Because as climate changes, the same habitat that existed here today is going to move north and it's going to move upslope. And if any of the wildlife and any of our habitat is going to survive, it's going to need our landscapes to be connected so they can move to the appropriate habitat as climate changes. We recognize people need jobs, people need food. So we're not saying protect everything. We're saying we're using the science to see where the animals live, see where they travel, see how they travel between source areas, and let's protect those pieces of landscape and recover the critters that help keep these systems alive. Uh, we need your help. Our budget every year is just about $2 million. We have a lot of support from Microsoft. We'd love to have your support during the giving campaign. We have several members of our steering committee in the meeting today, if you'd raise your hands. You may know some of these folks. Every year they help us figure out what events to put on, how to promote them, and help how to get people involved. If you want to get involved in the effort to help us put up posters or spread the word, we'd love to have you help us. 
can't you have some posters in the back? I There's do. an event coming up on Tuesday if you can hold those up. There is. If anyone wants to put up posters in your building for the event on Tuesday that looks at how do we determine what landscapes to protect? How do we figure out what are the priority landscapes? You'll learn about that Tuesday. And what building is that in? Yeah, Tuesday. Let's see. C O D. Yes, indeed. What did uh, this one we decided to do in the morning instead of the afternoon being 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock, Studio D, looking at connected landscapes. So it's 447, so we got 13 minutes left. Any questions about tracking, about wolf recovery, or about conservation northwest? Yeah? Are wolf packs transplantable? Can, can they be moved or they don't want are, are wolves packs transplantable? And you can definitely translocate wolves. Uh, I don't know much about the record of translocating entire packs. Uh, usually you translocate individuals. Um, I don't know. Our, um, the wolf plan right now that's before the commission does have a uh, identified translocation as a tool for eventually getting wolves into other parts of the state. Because there's a requirement to have a certain number of packs in three separate recovery areas in the state. And we're concerned about the Olympics that's going to happen, but transportation could be an eventual tool to get that done. Okay. I understand that uh, it was kind of surprising how fast wolves have moved into some of the areas mm -hmm. without a lot of overt. Right. So it seems like if they if they get a foothold, if they get a, you know even a little way into some place, they'll... And now the Olympics is a different story maybe, but so they're not going to need a lot of help other wolves, places potentially. Wolves are a tremendously adaptable species and it really took probably the most concerted effort by any one species to destroy any other species to get them out of the western United States. And uh, the climate for that is over. You know, there's no poisoning campaigns, and, you know, state federally got sponsored trapping campaigns to get rid of every last wolf is done. And when you give them half a chance, wolves, uh, they can be highly reproductive. It's not uncommon for them to disperse 200 miles when they're young. And so uh, as long as the landscape can accommodate them, uh, and the human population <coughs> can accommodate them, they're going to do fine. And actually, the Tianue pack showing up is well within the range of where you might expect a pack to move, as, assuming that landscape is, is connected, you know, so that they don't have to travel through downtown Seattle, for instance, <laughs> to get there. Well, how do they react to you when they notice you take your pictures? How do they react to me? It really depends on the wolves. Wolves are. Um, are, are like people in that sense is like every, any person you bump into on the street in Seattle you don't know how they're going to necessarily react. Uh, uh, they tend to be usually uh, they're retiring like if they see humans they want to go flee from that. Sometimes they might be curious. Um, pups in particular are more curious than adults. Uh, most wolf adults if they've grown to be adult they've probably also learned a healthy bit of wariness about interacting with humans. Uh, and then ideally I try to observe them without being observed myself, although with an animal with the amazing sense of smell and sight and hearing that wolves have, it's pretty hard to do that. Dave, let me backtrack to the last question. One of the things that we were really happy about in discovering those first, first images of wolves is they are an affirmation that the connectivity that we worked on for 20 years is working. Mm. It does work. In fact, there's some evidence to suggest that the genetic roots of the wolves that first showed up in the Metal Valley show a dominant trace towards the coast BC wolves that Dave was talking about. But there's also some evidence to suggest that there's some genetic material from the Rockies. So both of the connectivity uh, corridors, if you will, although we don't really like that word, but the connected landscapes from the coast range to the Cascades and the Cascades to the Rockies are in place and working. But we have to finish. We have to make sure that this stuff is preserved because there's a lot of it that if we don't do the work to preserve it will end up being split up in ranchettes and new roads and golf courses and wineries. All good things in the right <laughs> place, but you know, not in these prime corridors. That's where we're fighting the battle right now for the Columbia Highlands Initiative to protect the Colville National Forest and connect the Cascades to Rockies. And there's two wolf packs that Dave was photographing up in that region of the state. So when you make the argument um, that uh, forest degradation occurs with overpopulation of the elk and deer, um, 
What kind of response do you get in, in terms of people saying, well, we don't need rules for that. We have hunters that can control those populations. It's a great question. Let me have it first. And if I miss something, you guys can jump in. Um, great question. Why can't hunters control the, the uh, the game animals versus the wolves. Are we getting that response? And we actually do get that response from hunters, from some hunters. And the answer is that hunters go after the biggest trophy animals. They want the biggest ones with the largest racks. And these are dominant animals that are keeping the system working. They're actually keeping healthy populations of the ungulates when you have these big, handsome males. The wolves are going after the young ones, the sick ones, the, the ones that are on the edges, and are, the elimination of these animals is actually improving the health of the herds of the animals. So they're actually doing a, a service. The reality is, though, it does impact hunting, not in the pure numbers of animals so much that are killed, but as Dave mentioned, the behavior changes. So hunters have to work harder because the animals, the the elk and the moose and the deer are going to be more on the move and they're going to be more alert. But isn't that what hunting's about? No. I would just add to that that wolves hunt deer and elk 365 days a year. And the way that wolves hunt elk, they focus on places like riparian corridors where, where, where elk might be vulnerable. And so having wolves on a landscape will change the behavior of elk, even if the populations don't drop that the behavior might, of those animals might change. Whereas humans hunt during a very limited period of time, if they're illegally hunting, limited period of time of the year, and they hunt in a very different way. And so just the presence of wolves, they actually call it, they call it the ecology of fear, <coughs> the biologists coined that term, that the, the fear of wolves actually can change the behavior of animals, and that in turn will have ecological impacts, irregardless of changes in the population of those prey species. Yeah. How many individuals in the Northwest packs average about seven or eight uh, uh, animals, and they vary throughout the year. So you know, have four or five pups in the spring, and then a number of animals. Uh, uh, Three-year-olds might disperse, so they vary a lot. Uh, is it one breeding pair per pack? Typically, the typical the typical pack structure is an extended family. You'll have a breeding pair, and then multiple generations of their offspring. And then potentially, like a sibling of the breeding pairs might stick around, something like that. What are the states in which the effort is going on? Is it Washington, Oregon, and Idaho? For effort for conser conservation? conservation? Well, Conservation Northwest focuses primarily on Washington and then integrating with British Columbia. British Columbia, Washington. Jazz, what, what about the wolf plant? What does it impact about the wolf plant? The wolf plant is uh, Washington State, so it's a state management. But we also work um, in British Columbia as well <coughs> with endangered animals up there, as well, like grizzly bear. So, is it on the endangered list in Washington? It is. Yes. It's um, it's a little confusing, but the overview is they're listed federally in the western two thirds of the state. The eastern third is considered part of the Rockies population, which was recently removed from the endangered species list. Statewide, under the state endangered species laws, they're listed. The entire state is still listed. So, so what Jasper's pointing out, the fact that they were removed from the endangered species list of the Rockies is what's putting a lot of pressure on us to develop this wolf plant. Because without the plan, there's some momentum and some argument to suggest that these two Washington wolves are not protected. Um, but you could also see that happening to, to Washington, Western Washington wolves. Now, someone also asked about wolves in the Olympics. Um, a few years ago, we did research to recover Fisher in the, in the Olympic National Park. One of the reasons we investigated recovering Fisher, and actually now we have Fisher recovered for the first time in, what, 80 years in the Olympics? Part of why we did that project is to learn how to do recovery of species where we need to bring animals in. Jasmine talked about translocation. So we have that experience, and we may apply that experience to to wolves in one of many different mm -hmm. locales sometime in the future. Do wolves like human food? So if you're backpacking in... Do wolves food? like human food? So <laughs> typically no. Uh, you, can't, well, you can train wolves to be food conditioned, 
and that has happened in some places in North America, pretty rarely, but it takes a concerted effort of kind of poor camping behavior to do that. Uh, all of the precautions that go for bears is fine for wolves, and actually bears are far more adept and more interested uh, at getting human food than wolves, and pose far more of a hazard uh, to humans in that regard. Isn't there an exception to Snickers bar? Except for Snickers bar. <laughs> Question about Dave, you're an amazing photographer. I'd love to frame your work. <laughs> um, what's your best advice on uh, how to survive a hostile wolf encounter? A hostile wolf encounter. Well, if you were to have a hostile wolf encounter, it would most likely not be a wild wolf. Uh, because, like I said, you, wild wolves typically are very shy of humans. Uh, but as with any large carnivore, uh, appropriate precautions are, are smart. And generally, dealing with a uh, wolf that's acting unusually, would be, you'd interact with it similarly to like a mountain lion, which would be to demonstrate your presence, uh, be loud and vocal, make don't yourself run. look big, don't run, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and all of those things that you want to just demonstrate that you're aware of it, that you're not prey, that that, that you're going to you know respond if it attacks you vigorously. Different than bears. Do they uh, consider eye contact? Um, a threat? Do they consider eye contact a threat? <laughs> it would depend on the situation, uh, situationally, but certainly if I had a wolf that was acting aggressively towards me, which is something that, I mean, I've literally had wild wolves come within eight feet of me, not knowing I was there, and I had no sense of fear, and the thing I get from them is maybe curiosity, if they know there's something going on, but not aggressiveness. Uh, but yeah, look them in the eye and demonstrate that you're very aware of their presence. Uh, with bears, it's a little bit different because uh, with bears, you want to demonstrate that you're not a threat to them. Usually, they perceive you to be somebody that might be trying to get their food. And you want to say, no, no, you know, those berries are yours. You can have the berries, you know, I'll move over here. With with the uh, things like mountain lions, you know, there's usually more of like a predator in some form of there. So. But wolves are, there's a worldwide study of wolf attacks on humans. And it clearly showed that wolves are the least dangerous large carnivore to humans of any of our large carnivores. What's the statistic on wolves versus dogs? Oh, uh, I can't. I mean, it's like. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's thousands of dog attacks and thousands of wolf attacks. and then remote cameras are also important tools that are needed to discover and then monitor wolf populations. And in British Columbia, actually, there's some really great research that use scat. They collect wolf scats, and from that they're actually finding out about the genetics and looking at various populations, and they were so very non-invasive method to monitor wolves. I think there's a promising future for that. <laughs> just need to find people that want to go out and pick up wolves. And as an apex predator, that'll it'll regulate, right? It'll get to a maximum density and it'll just stop, right? That's yeah. So wolf populations, like any wildlife population in a natural environment, fluctuate depending on their prey, depending on environmental conditions, depending on illnesses. So yeah, the the concept that wolves would grow to such numbers that they would kill all of the deer and elk. It's actually really funny because there is a social carnivore in uh, the Northwest that did kill all, all of the elk <laughs> in the Northwest, or nearly all of them, and it's us. <laughs> uh, we got rid of all of the elk in the, in 
most of the Rockies and uh, in the Cascades. Uh, we'd like to think that wolves would do that so we feel better about ourselves, but wolves yeah. won't do that. Now that, that said, Dave, um, there is, there is um, acknowledgement in the wolf management plan that there may be a time when wolves are recovered to the degree that some wolves would need to be culled. There's a number of compromises that need to be made to have a, a plan, and um, that is something that's being accommodated. And that's one of the key elements of the plan is how many wolves is, is recovered. Well, I think that's also really reasonable. Like there's a hunting season on bears and mountain lions, and those populations have stable populations in the state, and uh, they're actually managed fairly progressively by the state of Washington. We actually are fairly lucky to live in a state that has a progressive, be oriented wildlife. Uh, management organizations. So. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. And about the Olympics, how do we get sufficient of genetic diversity in an area like that? Mm -hmm. in other areas? So, mm -hmm. and getting, getting, you know. It's a great question. How would you get um, sufficient diversity, biodiversity in an area like the Olympics, particularly when they have such a large range oh, that's not uh, connected in other areas? And that's one of many challenges for the Olympics. Um, but there are answers to many of these, but yeah, that is one of the challenges. Do you have a good answer for that one, Jasmine? I think there's probably always been a challenge for that particular landscape, just because of the topography. But then you add I-5. I think the natural way for moves to move, move into the Olympics is through the South, Southern Cascade into the private timberlands of southwestern Washington and then up the arm. And there is a route, we've mapped it through our connectivity work. Um, the biggest challenge is crossing I-5. But there are spots along I-5 where it can be done. So it just takes that brave lone wolf that wants to find new territory to find that route. And I think eventually they will because they'll, they follow the, the elk. So does Oregon have a plan? Oregon does have a plan. They were one of, they, they had one before we did. It's not as, I would say it's not as progressive as Washington's plan. Um, it requires fewer number of wolves before delisting, and they've had more problems with that plan and or, or, or disagreement um, in their state over how wolves should be managed. How do you cross I-5? Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how would a wolf cross I-5? Yeah. Um, I think there's some areas near um, kind of Longview that are more forested on each side and maybe wolves would find a time of night that where there's less traffic and go for it. But it's such a it's such a good question. Yeah. And it's the when we do our, our, our connectivity mapping, major roads are, are one of the main things that, that draw the areas that are left to connect. And this is why it was so imperative that we finish the I ninety bridges we work on. So the wildlife across I ninety and we're also working on the bridges on Highway 97 that would help our connectivity to Cascades and the Rockies, but the yeah, I-5 is a challenge. But, when you don't, but don't give up, because remember, a cougar and a black bear both showed up in Seattle's Discovery Park in the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of bridges on I-5 on the south, right? So for the rivers, are yeah. they be used for? Yeah, those are yeah. things like considered underpass. Although yeah. I don't think there's a lot of place station on some of them. Yeah. Plus they have a tough time using those turnstiles. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, we would love to have you consider being members of Conservation Northwest. You can become a member. Asa, do you have these flyers sitting there? We got a you can become a member here. for $35, or you can um, remember us in the giving campaign this year. Um, if you know Kent or Shauna or Mark Christensen in the back, they've all been members for, gosh, I think each of you has been around at least 10, 15 years. And they'd be happy to, to answer any questions you have if you know them. Yep. Bill? I was going to say, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll hang around for a while. And if yeah, you guys have questions about what, you know, why I love Conservation Northwest and what I see in us, the value of their group, just pop them by. And feel, please feel free. I'm Paul at Conservation NW. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about our work or about wildlife or connectivity in general. <coughs> Final request if any of you have any time tomorrow. We're bringing people down to support the wolf recovery plan in Olympia. And we're providing transportation and a happy hour afterwards. So um, thank you all for coming. And Dave, hand for Dave. Um, thank you. And also posters, if anyone wants to put yeah, on the buildings. And we have, news, we have newsletters as well.
as well. Our latest oh, newsletters. newsletters too. There's a lot of good uh, details that map nicely with this presentation in the newsletter. Why there? <laughs> So, yeah, I'm going to go. 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 I'm going to